Real estate investing can bring big reward and big risks. So know your risks. Welcome to the Real Estate Risk Report, the show for real world insight on real estate investment risk. Now, here's your host, Lance Peterson. Thank you for joining the Real Estate Risk Report. I'm your host, as always, Lance Peterson. So today I have with me Jesse Fregali with Avison Young. He is based in Toronto, Canada. How are you doing, Jesse? I'm doing great, Lance. How are you? Good, man. Yeah, so Jesse, uh, he had me on his podcast a few weeks back, so we're sort of uh, swapping places. So I can kind of uh, put Jesse on the hot seat, so to speak, and learn a little bit more about him and uh, how he looks at things. But before we get there, uh, why don't you share with the audience sort of how you got into the real estate biz and what attracted you to it and you know the types of things that you're up to and working on these days? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, thanks. Uh, that was uh, you nailed the nailed the pronunciation of my name. So that doesn't always happen. So perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. In terms of the uh, the background for me, uh, my story with real estate really started uh, in college. Uh, I went to a school in uh, in Ontario, about an uh, hour and a half west of Toronto. Uh, a school called Laurier. It's in Waterloo, which is kind of like Canada's tech hub. Um, probably, mm. you know comparable to uh, to the West uh, Coast for you guys. Um, and in, in terms of how I first started, it was uh, it was in college. I was playing um, I was playing uh, football uh, in school and I was getting my place rented out uh, or I was renting a place with a couple friends. And one of my uh, buddies actually owned the place that we lived in. And that was kind of the first time I really saw younger guys, you know, operating real estate, uh, renting space out. And it kind of clicked for me. And for me, that really coincided with the fact that, you know, my father, very entrepreneurial, both my father and my mother. Um, and I always grew up with a kind of like a, one of my dad's buddies, uh, you know, an uncle that you're not related to that uh, had started renting out properties when I was really uh, well, before I was born. But I kind of grew up in this, you know, that's your, you know, your buddy, Mikey, that owns all those properties. Yeah. And those two things kind of clicked for me. And that's really how I got my start. I, I started renting out uh, properties in school and that's really my, was my first exposure and, and learning, uh, you know, learning deals, reading books, you know, at the time there really wasn't any podcasts. It was more so going to chapters or going to yeah. Barnes and Noble and picking up like, you know, the, in that, at that time was the Canadian real estate magazine was one of like the big ones. So that was, uh, that was my first exposure. Yeah. And it's, so for you then, after getting out of college, then the, the, did you remain independent or is that how you ended up getting kind of into the, the brokerage side as sort of the the, the more the, the career like, hey, I'm going to sell real estate and not only op own and operate it? Yeah, that was kind of um, that happened a little bit later. So what originally happened for me is I, I went into actually oil and gas and, and uh, kind of the background mm -hmm. for me was economics and um, I'm sure listeners in the States or Canada, Enbridge Inc. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that I worked there for a number of years and I had continued to buy real estate. So in school, I started buying rental properties and I started scaling those. And when I got my first job, it, I was back in Toronto and continued to buy uh, pre-construction condos in Toronto because our market was extremely hot and uh, pre-construction was kind of what was booming at the time. And um when I actually initially did uh, almost start at the same brokerage that I'm with now, Avison Young, um, five or seven years earlier, uh, it just happened that I was already in the swing of things with my other job. So I said, you know what, I do real estate on my own anyways. Uh, you know, don't need to make it my day job as well. Um, and then kind of a light bulb moment years down the down the road was uh, just a close friend of my family was like, listen, like, you obviously love real estate uh, and you don't necessarily have to pick the same vertical that you invest in. And uh, yeah, I, I made the switch and it uh, kind of never, never looked back, so to speak. And the nice thing with that switch was what I do for in the uh, brokerage side is predominantly office uh, leasing and investment sales. So very different than buying, you know, residential or multi-residential commercial real estate. Mm -hmm. And so for, for you then, do you, is it you only invest in Canada or do you do, do you, do you do deals in the U S or? Yeah. So as a company, we have an apartment fund. I think it's a smaller, like, I mean, for, for the, our company size, it's a $75 million apartment fund. So 
we can invest through through, uh, through the apartment fund. I think they they wrapped that one up recently, um, but that's definitely uh, American focused. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I have only invested in Canada. I've wanted to move into uh, American markets. And I think we talked a little bit about this on my podcast, but mm -hmm. for us, the big thing is establishing kind of an identity first, whether that's, you know, getting the ITIN number, getting the bank uh, set. Okay. I think the plan for my partners and I are, is actually going to be to buy something smaller, probably single family. Um, mm -hmm. I like Orlando. I like Charleston. There's a couple markets that I think would be um, you know, great for us to invest in and basically start to build a quotations identity in the States. Yeah. Um, I have family that lives in, in New York, but, and the other thing being in Toronto, you know, I'm, I'm an hour and yeah. 20 minutes away from Buffalo or hour and a half away from Buffalo, but, or, you know, Rochester, but those are markets that, um, you know, the closest ones were that we are geographically are, are the ones that I won't want to invest in for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can chat about, I mean, there, it seems that the real estate market, like you said, like in Toronto or Vancouver or, uh, I mean, just in general, maybe you can shed some light on just the, the, the differences, right. Between investing in real estate in the U S and in Canada, although we, you know, we're obviously it's adjacent and right across the, the way it doesn't, it, they operate differently. Right. I mean, it's just, it's not, um, it, and it seems to me, obviously, just from watching like the, uh, the HD TV shows with the property brothers or whatnot, when they were in Canada, it just seems like it's ridiculously expensive, right? Yeah. Or even like Vancouver, like how in the heck do people even afford to live up there? It's, um, yeah, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's, there's a lot there in terms of the, the actual regulatory environment. We're for all intents and purposes, we're a rent control country, um, rent stabilization, rent control, whatever you want to call it. Um, Alberta is probably the one that has the most flexibility, but generally speaking, uh, unless you uh, have a new tenant, you cannot raise rent more than the uh, national or provincial guidelines, which are extremely low. Like we're talking like 1.8%, um, at, at least this year, last time I checked. In terms of the differences, obviously, or maybe not so obviously to, to whoever is listening, but Canada tends to be more conservative when it comes to the banking. I think, uh, I think we're more cautious. And I think the real estate reflects that. So we, we have had property values go up substantially over the last five to 10 years. Let's just pick, uh, you know, some of the major markets, whether it's Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto. Um, I can give you some insight on Toronto. On average, uh, multi-residential properties are trading in Toronto and the greater Toronto area, typically not under 275,000 and that could per unit. And that could be mm. up at 350,000 per unit. And with our exchange rate, I mean, that's not really that different in USD. You know, that 300 is maybe 260. It's a very expensive market. Yeah. Um, I think where there are opportunities, though, is that there are value add investors that have a business model that they see uh, uh, under market property. And they know that it's not going to be like um, Austin, Texas, where you could just go in and say, you're done your lease. See you later. You have to actually be a good operator and be able to talk with tenants. And one thing that we do allow, even though there's all this rent control, all this stabilization, they still haven't taken up, taken away, um, you know, fingers crossed, the freedom to negotiate with a current tenant and say, listen, we, we want you to sign an end of tenancy. We acknowledge that, you know, we can't just boot you. Is there a number? Is there a price that that makes sense? And we're starting to see a lot more of that uh, hmm. in the market. And I guess the last thing I would just say on the on the mortgage side, uh, the idea of a thirty year fix is is foreign to us. There's no, there's no equivalent uh, to that in Canada, um, at least on the residential side as well. I don't believe, and you could correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the U.S. you typically don't have the ability to port your mortgages when you sell a property, so we can take the mortgage and port it to another another bank. I'm not sure if you you have that in your state. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure it's a Canadian thing, but just on that point in terms of financing, our rates are slightly lower. Like our Fannie Mae Freddie Mac would be the Canadian Mortgage Housing Corporation. So mm -hmm. CMHC uh today's rates for a 10-year commercial loan would probably be about 1.5. <laughs> um yeah, 1.6. So I the reason I mentioned that is cuz I you, you hear a lot of times uh, people that maybe tangentially know the market either Canadians knowing the US or vice versa. And, mm -hmm. and you hear people saying, Oh, how is it that you can get a three 
percent cap rate in a downtown Toronto market. It's like, well, that's that's how it's it's that interest rates. You might be locking them in at one point three, one point four. Yeah. Yeah. So for for you though, like your your day to day activity, I mean, outside of the, the office and the day job, I mean, like right now, then what are you? What kind of opportunities are you looking at? Like what? How, how do you? make money as a real estate guy up there? Like what, what is the opportunity and, and what your buy box, so to speak, what are you looking for? Yeah. So we are falling into that value add, um, component. So for us, what we're looking at number one, I mean, off market, uh, it's just, you know, just being a broker myself, like there's just, if it's on MLS, if, if it's yeah. anywhere online posted 99 times out of hundred, it's, it's not, uh, it's not something we can make money on. So for us, for like right now, we have a building um, that we're purchasing and it is about 50, 55 percent under market. Uh, and we're looking at that from the perspective of coming in, uh, paying a certain amount. What we have to do, given the financing, um, because the debt service coverage ratio is so low because mm-hmm. of the, the lack of income, is that we are really going into a lot of deals with doing uh, say a 12 to 24 month bridge loan. Uh, so an interest only loan, take us to the point where we can turn over a number of the suites, go back to our lender, refinance, pay out the bridge, and then put stabilized debt on the property and then operating, operating from that, uh, from that, um, point forward in terms of the value add though, you know, we're also looking at future, um, path of progression. So if we see that there's the the feds are putting or the the provinces are putting in money for uh, transit for uh, light rail, you know, whatever it is, we're looking at areas in, in that because what's happening is, especially in Toronto, a lot of the density is coming along where these um, different transit is being put in. Yeah. So we're definitely looking at properties in those areas. And then lastly, you know, the gravy on top is if you have an area that you know, potentially you can build another story or maybe there's an assembly play. You know, we wouldn't put all our uh, eggs in one basket for that, but it's definitely something that we'll, we'll look at. So ultimately to answer your question, it's, it's really the value adds because the coupon clippers are, you won't get them in the, in any of the CBDs. Like you'll have to go an hour two hour outside of the cities, which is starting to happen a lot more now. Yeah. So, I mean, so the translation there is just, it's, for, for you guys, it really does. It's it's more of the, it's the growth, not necessarily the, the cash flow. Because what you're then, your your exit strategy is to sell it to someone who is, it's more, they, I mean, like you guys are just trying to add the value, force appreciation, and then flip it to someone who wants the coupon clip or whatever. Like it's not your problem, right? It's yeah, not, I mean, yeah. ideally, ideally, uh, you know, we would do that transition, Um and it sounds uh, it sounds so low, and I get when when uh, people from the U.S. say, "But we buy this property at a three point one cap, um, which is almost it, it's an unimportant number if you know in the event that you have an underlease space, right? Like we've seen clients mm-hmm. of ours buy one caps because the the vac- the the vacancy is so high. It's like yeah. it starts becoming kind of a useless useless metric. But let's say that the market cap in that area is three and a half. And we th- think that there's a hundred thousand dollars that we could add to NOI. That's the approach. We capitalize that, um, you know, at the given cap rate, and then you know we have the options of potentially selling it um, or hanging on to it. And then we're the ones that are clipping the coupon and looking for the next deal. Because for us, like I'm le- like another thing with Canada, you, the transaction volume is a lot lower. We don't have 1031s ex- uh, 1031 exchange here. Um, it's yeah. just not an option to us. So buy and hold is, is a big part of, I guess you'd say like the Canadian investment strategy. Okay. No, that's great. Yeah. Okay. So that, that makes more sense. So it, it is like in order to, you, you extract that value up front, but it, it really is, it's a buy and hold. So you got to be a much more longer term, but to your point, these assets just aren't changing hands as, as, as frequently as they do in many of the markets in the U S. Um, and so from that perspective, do you, how does it like the syndication work? I mean, is that something that you're, that you're doing or you do like more joint ventures, like how the equivalent, cause obviously we've got a lot of multifamily syndicators and they're raising 50 grand, you know, a, a pop from investors. And so for, for you guys, what does that look like up in Canada? 
Yeah. So this last deal uh, it, w that we're doing is a syndication. And it's funny, you like it's it's a question that um, all the investors ask in terms of exit strategy. What's the plan? So for, for this particular property, kind of the one I outlined, uh, it would be a situation where we add this value, um, we refinance, stabilize the debt. And then really what we're telling our investors is like, listen, we're going to, we're not going to not listen to investors. Um, we're obviously as general partners, we have the autonomy to make certain decisions, but mm -hmm. if we have some, you know, walk away price three years into the investment. We're not going to not like look at it seriously. Yeah. And if it was me personally that owned it, or if it was like other deals I've done in the past, mm -hmm. that's just say myself or myself and a partner then you know i'd probably be more likely to want to hold on um or at the very least refi um but in this syndication there's definitely that uh situation that because our markets have appreciated so much uh and have like that's been a big component of them mm -hmm. uh, not to say that this is going to keep happening but in the yeah. event that that did happen i think we would need to prudently look at potentially exiting uh you know the the investors uh, that we have and, and sell the deal uh, and then kind of go from there. Yeah. yeah. Did, did the structures mean you and I were talking about that when I was on your podcast a little bit, but does that then change the way the structure works? Right. Because if it is, you know, anticipating maybe longer hold periods, I mean, how the GP is compensated, right? Cause here, of course, because there is a lot of transactions and there's depth of the market and you see you trading hands, then, you know, I know when people talk about it, right. Like it's, it's kind of not great alignment, right. Because, it, it just the, the sponsor, the GPs incentivized to sort of want to sell because that's how they get paid. Um, do you guys have some sort of, you see more like crystallization sort of mechanisms in the deal where, where, or, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Because let's face it. I mean, the asset management fee or whatever one earns, I mean, it's, you're not, you know, you're not getting rich off some asset management fee. And especially for you guys, you're going in and it's heavy lift one to find the opportunities. Like you said, they're off market, the low, low vacancy, you know, you've got rehab or whatever you need to do to it to sort of get it where it needs to go. I mean, I call that work. And, yeah. you know, last time I checked, people need to be paid to do work like that. So does it end up manifesting itself in different structures, like higher acquisition fees or higher asset management fees or crystallization or how does you that work? I think, uh, I think the States has, I mean, we talked about this before. I think the States, um, there's just been a big proliferation of syndication deals for better or for worse. Some people that, have, that, you know, know what they're doing. Some people that don't, um, it hasn't been that, uh, intense in, like north of the border in terms of how many people are doing it. So syndications are starting to become more popular, uh, but they're still, I think, in their infancy here. For us, it, it, the the old school kind of real estate, you know, when you ended up getting bigger was you uh, started a real estate investment trust and you see these like large mm -hmm. Canadian REITs. So yeah. there's this big gap between, you know, you yeah. know Joe uh, Joe Average and, and these mm -hmm. large corporations. In terms of, to answer your question, does the structure change? I think the only reason I would say that it doesn't necessarily change is because both of both the LPs and GPs are almost realigned in the sense that yes, the GP is going to have to wait longer if the hold is longer, mm -hmm. but because the cash there's no cash flow in almost every CBD deal um, in you know any major market here, so is the LP, right? They're just accruing their pref. So yeah. we know that we're both looking at the exit. So I think there is kind of a, re, yeah. a, like I said, a realignment in that, you know, we don't, if there's a situation where we could have a capital event, and like I said, that doesn't have to be a sale, it could be a uh, cash yeah. out refinance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're both looking at that with the same, um, <laughs> you know, the same amount of energy and the same amount of, uh, I guess, the want to to get to that point. Yeah. You know, I, I've spoken with some uh this 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 lady in uh australia you know and so she's got an investor club and you know teaches them sort of these financial freedoms but she's explaining to me like down there i mean it's it's way more dramatic than what you're talking about in canada but it's like you there is no such thing as cash flowing real estate in australia like it doesn't exist yeah. like it's just it's, it's just kind of weird right because being in in the states it's like a, it's a huge deal. I mean, like the, it's, you can generate cash flow from real estate. Like that's, that's, 
That's the beauty of it, right? And yeah, then you've got depreciation, point. you got cash flow and depreciation and offsets income. Like it's the it's the it's the American dream. I mean, it's just like it's so great. So it's it's interesting. Um, you know, how the different, you know, policies and things, obviously, in, in between one country and the next, how they deal with it, right? And what and what it incentivizes, ultimately, I think that's what we're known for in the States is that we incentivize, I mean, you know, 1031 exchange, all these different things, we go a long way to incentivize development of real estate, like, like, it, it's, it's just part of how we operate here. And that's why it's always interesting to talk with investors I had another gal call me who, She's she's out in um uh where is she at? She's in uh Manitoba, right? And you know, talking about single family homes and wanting to do a fund and you know, same same thing, saying like she thinks that she's telling me that she feels like there's this bubble and the prices are gonna drop for single family. Like that's what she's predicting, right? Mm-hmm. So she, of course, is thinking, well, I want to accumulate some capital to basically go on a buying binge. Um well, I you think know. I think the other thing people it's it's a, I, I don't think it's a small distinction. I think people don't realize it too. Like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, there's a national policy of of encouragement to home ownership. People think it's the same in Canada, but CMHC, our kind of uh, you know uh, governing body for um, that that's the equivalent. Their mandate isn't to encourage home ownership; it's to encourage affordable housing. Housing. And it's like yeah. a slight distinction, but it's definitely a different idea of when you say the American dream, right? One is actually, uh, and it's been for a long time in the States to encourage home ownership. Yeah. And the other one is is not. And that's reflected, I think, in kind of some of the policy outcomes. I think one distinction, though, just because there's, you know, Canadians, uh, if there are Canadians listening, I don't want to, um, you know, be so Toronto centric like we often are. Like we're also one of the most expensive, uh, if not the most expensive, maybe Vancouver, uh, Canadian city to live in. So yeah. there are opportunities outside, you know, you draw concentric circles outside of the cities um, and you start getting into these 18 hour cities that you're getting better cap rates, you're getting cash flow. So I think it, it's it, it partly that. And then the function of the fact that, you know, to compare Toronto to the States, you got to compare us to LA, Boston, New York, yes. in terms yeah. of, you know, and, and any American will tell you the same thing. It's like, well, you want a cash flow. Why are you, you know, why yeah. are you buying stuff in, you know, in, uh, in LA? No. So it's, I think it's a, it's a similar component uh, here. And I don't know if this stat is accurate. It's, it's hard to find these stats, but I, I was just talking to a colleague of mine and he said that in the States, there were 40 million uh, apartment units. I don't know, you could probably confirm if that's right or not, but he said, Compared to Canada, there's just shy of two million, and I I try to confirm it online, but it doesn't sound crazy to me. And yeah. even though like the population is ten times larger, our stock is just not even not even close to the comparable. Yeah, no, it is it is interesting. So for for you then, with all that being said, I mean, and and you're obviously still you know young in your career. I mean, is are you? I know you guys are looking to kind of break into the you know U.S. markets. I mean, is is a move on the horizon for Jesse? Like, like is that does that cross your mind? Like, hey, I mean, because you love this stuff, and I, I know you do, right? But it it just seems like, and not obviously, like you said, I mean, you can you can transact in Toronto, and you can you know figure that out. But is is a guy like you? Is that what often happens? Where you're kind of like, well, uh, I, th- I think I need to make the move to the states and and and, and go that route. Yeah, you know what? It, it comes down to well, number one, like I think we are definitely want to invest in the states. That goes without saying. Yeah, um, I really love love uh, love the U.S. Um, I you know I think I would probably live there as well. Uh, there to me, I think what would be the ter- determining factor for that is if there's an inflection point where I start doing enough, almost ninety percent of my business is investing and a lot less is brokerage because. Yeah. Even though we have like our company has 84 offices, you know, as you know, and as your listeners uh, know, real estate is so local and you could be, you know, a million dollar broker in Mm -hmm. Manhattan and then pick up and move to San Francisco. And then you got to start almost from scratch. I mean, not completely, but pretty much you just build a, you build a base in, in that particular city. So it's not as, uh. uh, mobile as your investment business is. So that would definitely have to. Yep. You know, it, it would have to be a point where I, I say I'm going to make the jump. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And it, it points back to the fact that real estate, like you said, it's local and it's a relationship business. 
So it, it's it, you have to have the connections because even like your guys' ability to find something that's off market, you know, fifty five percent below, you know, like whatever market value. I mean, that doesn't happen. You don't just stumble into that sort of stuff. It came because you knew somebody and you had the connections. Um, so let's shift to sort of office. I mean, obviously the, the entire globe has gone through this pandemic and is still sort of, you know, trying to battle their way out of it. And, you know, a big part of this is sort of how are we going to use office in the future? Right. And I know that as I, <laughs> I'm the guy who's been into the office every day since this whole thing happened. And I've basically been by myself yeah, and, you know, as I speak and as I speak to you, you know, I'm in this 4,000 square foot office all by myself. Um, <laughs> so because the accountants and everyone else has realized like working from home is awesome. I mean, I, I'd probably work from home if I didn't have five kids that were, you know, <laughs> that were there and a dog, but so, yeah. but what does that look like in the future? You know, it, it's, is the death of office upon us or is, is it more nuanced than that? Well, I mean, first of all, just a caveat, clearly I'm biased, uh, but I think one thing that um, people in our world, especially in the office world, knew prior to the pandemic that there was a direction office uh, leasing and, and purchasing was headed. And that happened, that preceded this yeah. pandemic. In the same way, I think the people in our office uh, that work predominantly in retail, you know, they'll tell you the same thing. Obviously, they got a hard shove into where I think retail was already heading. Um, but in terms of in terms of office, I think uh, a number of changes. It, it's going to be interesting to see where things shake out. If you look at a lot of the studies of uh, you know different working environments, uh, what CEOs are saying, what employees are saying, it seems like some sort of hybrid model will shake out after everything is said and done. At least that's my opinion. Whether mm -hmm. that's one or day, one or two days a week working from home. In terms of the actual square footage per person, you know, you could have. Uh, startup companies at 115 or 100, even that low, 100 square foot per person. And then, you know, law firms with larger offices might be 200, 200 square feet per person plus. Um, in terms of where does that shake out after the pandemic, it's really hard to say because our larger multinational clients are saying, first, they were like, we need less space, people are working from home. And then now they're saying, we want to bring the workforce back into the office in a hybrid model. Uh, oh, we actually might need more now because we're trying to social distance. And now it's like, w whether it's going to shrink or expand, I think the conventional wisdom in our industry is that it will net out to almost just be a wash, maybe a little bit less space. Now that isn't, uh, isn't to say smaller companies that their uh, rent makes up a higher percentage of their revenue, they would will be more sensitive, right? And they might actually shrink. And we've seen a number of companies do that. I think the big story the last 12 to, I can't believe, what is it now, the 15 months yeah. has been, is that the sublease markets, whether you know, you're know you in any, uh, whether you're in Miami, New York, the sublease markets have kind of exploded. Uh, yeah. we, we went from 500,000 square feet to 3 million square feet. Wow. So a lot of people, a lot of inventory has been put on the sublease market, which is for our market, for markets like LA or, or Toronto or Vancouver, it's, I think it's been healthy because we've been in this low vacancy environment for the longest time where tenants mm. pretty much had no say. But one thing that is encouraging a stat, I think CBRE released uh, about a, a few weeks ago, was that Q1, at least in our market, uh, Q1 was the first uh, time where they were a 44% decline in sublease the market. So what that's telling me is People are kind of looking around, even in our market, which has been locked down hard. They're starting to look around and be like, okay, let's pause on making any, you know, rash decisions with our real estate. Let's just see how this plays out. And that's kind of where we're at today. It's really, you know, yeah. to boil it down to uh, one sentence, it's just kicking the can down the road. That's what yeah. a lot of CFOs and COOs have been doing for the last 12 months. Yeah. And like you said, it, it's Toronto in particular has been. I mean, one of the more locked down cities in North America. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, uh, so, I mean, here people, I mean, Oregon is similar. I think, you know, we've been, I mean, they just went backwards again, right? Like, oh no, we're back at DEF CON, you know. No, oh, did they, did they lock, they lock down again? <laughs> yeah, or you like, can't, um, you can't, yeah, I think in Multnomah County, you can't eat inside anymore. I, I don't know, right? Like, and, and that's uh, part I'd of the problem. Yeah. Eat outside right now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's, 
I, I've lost track, right? But you you see that we keep we keep going backwards, and um, so for 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 you guys, I mean, I guess the translation. So with the sublease market kind of exploded, be like, oh crap, let's put this on there, and then everyone was like, okay, now let's let, let's go see if we can get some sweet space uh, on the sublease market, and now everyone's sort of like, hey, hang on a second, we don't know what to do with this. Like maybe the sun is coming out. I mean, how how are things going on? Like your ability to vaccinate and is that are they doing okay there? Or is that sort of so, lagging? Out well? I mean, at 32, I pretty much have no shot anytime soon. Uh, I think we just lowered the age to 45. Like my, you know, people, you know, my parents, they both can can get vaccinated. Uh, I think I think my mom has. So like, if you're if you're above the age of 60, I think um, you can. I think it's fairly easy to get vaccinated. Uh, I know over 45, there's, there has been some policy change recently. Um, but I mean, for us younger guys and gals, it's, uh, it's pretty much impossible. And I mean, the reality is like, I, after we heard so many different back and forths from different health professionals, I think my perspective has been a kind of cost benefit analysis, whether somebody disagrees with that, um, you know, is, is their opinion, but I kind of, like you said, you're in the office. I was going to the office every day and my cost benefit was, you know, being free and being able to kind of go through my life uh, and having a very low chance of, uh, at least statistically, of of having an issue. You know, I, I, I took the risk. I know that some people can't. I don't, I have the benefit of living sure. alone. Um, you know, I'm not worried about, you know, family members in close proximity. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. But in terms of the, the point where, you know, the C, CFOs and C-suite uh, people at, at companies, they are starting, I think, to make decisions because we usually see it from the, from the broker's perspective. It starts as inquiries, you know, what's going on? How's, you know, you get yeah. up to date? and then it starts with some tours. And I think what's starting to happen is for a long time, you know, our decision makers were saying, if I don't make a decision, I don't get fired. If I make a bad decision, I could possibly be let go. So yeah. I think pandemic, what it told a lot of people in those positions were they were just being extra cautious. Yes. But at a certain point, you know, you know, as you know, in commercial leases, your right to renew usually has a, a fairly tight window depending yeah. on who writes the lease. So you yeah. can't just completely kick the can down the road without having yep. some implications. Yeah. 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 It's been fascinating. The whole thing has just been, it, it's just, it's been amazing to watch how, you know, all these moves that have been made and, and things just swing in all sorts of different directions from, Oh, the distress is going to be ridiculous. And I was one of those guys where I'm like, this is not going to be good. But of course I didn't think that at least in the States, I'm like, I just didn't foresee them getting that aggressive with stimulus. I mean, it just, it still yeah. boggles my mind. I'm like, I can't believe they were just sending out that much money. Like that's just doesn't, it's never happened. Right. And it's, it's just, it's nuts, man. I mean now, and it's going to be nuts just watching what happens in the fallout of this and inflation yeah. and interest rates. Like, I mean, I mean, I'm just the real estate risk report. This is what we talk about all the time. But like, man, I have no idea what's going to happen. I'm more of like, let's sit back and 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 watch and see how this thing plays out. I was, you know, what I think, you know, this is just, I don't know if this is completely accurate. I haven't really thought it out, but I think at least from the Canadian perspective, and I think for the most part in the states, the fallout of 08, 09, I think was that that there was a lot of we didn't react quick enough. And for better or for worse, I think that both our government kind of jumped on it uh, with stimulus. Uh, and, and probably probably part of the real estate being buoyed, I think a lot of people in the multi-res space thought that you know we were gonna, only going to get 70 to 60% of rents. And they've been extremely high in terms of, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of getting people yeah. rent and not having a lot, a lot of delinquencies. The question, though, I think is, to your point, is, you know, I think the states now, I think it's... I want to say it's 10 trillion. I think it was like two, mm -hmm. two, two, and then, and then four or something. Yeah. But I think the question is like, you know, I think now you got to kind of pull the, pull the brakes on, on some of the spending, but you know, it, the way it's currently going, I'd be, I'd be surprised if, if the, uh, if the Democrats keep the house, um, you know, if based on, on how much spending has been happening and the potential implications of that over the next year. Yeah. It's, it's going to be interesting. 
Good stuff. Well, where can people, uh, you know, find you? I know where did you like, you've got your podcast and you got a lot of great guests on there. Um, I mean, not, not myself, but you, a bunch of other <laughs> really great guests. Uh, so where, where can they learn more about you, Jesse, and uh, keep up with what you're what you're up to? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, Lance, you're a great guest, uh, but they can uh, reach me, Jesse, J-E-S-S-E for Galley, F-R-A-G-A-L-E uh, on Instagram. Uh, a lot of times, you know, people ask me questions or kind of link up with me there. Uh, other than that, uh, Working Capital, the real estate podcast, wherever you listen to podcasts. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Well, it's great catching up, Jesse. Take care, man. Take care, Lance. See you.